six ten for real. For real, yeah. you ain't shrunk a little bit because you like thirty eight now, ain't you? Like, no, oh, I'm only twenty six. <laughs> uh -huh. All right now, still young. <laughs> Them years starting to speed up now. Eat the candle. He, I don't know if he can touch the top of the backboard like he used to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me find the theme music. We can get started. There is Alex with the big There's bright Alex. smile. I'm telling you, gentlemen. Here we go. Legit. We're back with another episode of Talking Preps. I got my man Kennedy Meeks uh, yes, on the show with us. He's uh, good enough to join us. How you doing, Kennedy? I'm doing well. How are you guys? I'm good, good man. On. I ain't seen you in the month of Sunday. I know, right? Oh, man, it's been a while. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you would tell me you just came back from overseas. Where were you? What was it like? I was in Seoul, on South Korea. Um, it was just like just like here, everything closed early because of the. Um, COVID and stuff, but it was a it was a good experience overall. Um, I think I've grown as a player for sure. Yeah, well, man, you know, I asked you to come on to talk about the news with uh, Carolina, and I wanted to get your thoughts. First of all, where were you when you got the news about Coach Williams? What did you think? And then let's talk about Hubert in a second. But just first, your thoughts about where you were when, when Roy announced, and what did you think of it when you heard it? Oh, well, I was just I just got I just got done working out, and I had. Uh, sat down to eat breakfast and I saw it and I jumped up. It was a complete shock to me and my family and stuff, you know, so it was it was pretty um, difficult to watch because you never thought that the day was going to come as soon as it did. And uh, but I think that the, the path that they went is, is a great path. It's a new look for our school. It's an opportunity for us to grow in a different direction. And I think Coach Davis will do a, a tremendous job. You know Coach Davis really well, obviously. He was there when you were there. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think he's going to bring to the program? And I know he said he's going to still maintain the Carolina way, but do you think he's going to tweak things at all? I think that he will tweak some stuff, um, but I also think that he will try to keep it um, as traditional as possible. Um, I think that Coach Davis is a great motivator. I think he's a competitor. Um, of course, his shooting ability and the way to teach – uh, shooting is, is off the chart. So I think that the guys will be great. I think they'll be a much better three-point shooting team. Um, hopefully they'll be as sound as Coach Williams had them and go from there. Kennedy, this morning they had on uh, one of your teammates, um, can't remember his last name, Kenny. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. And he talked about how the the players have a group chat. Group chat. Yeah. Um, and you know, everybody wanted it to stay in the family mm. In your estimation. If it wasn't coach Davis, who was second place in the family to getting that job? Personally, I think it was probably Wes Miller. I think mm -hmm. that, um, he had a great opportunity. He's shown that he could win, um, in their conference and he has the ability to be a, even better head coach for years to come. Um, so I think that he was definitely in the conversation. Um, I think Stackhouse was in the conversation. That's a terrible picture. Look at that. What a boy grew in. <laughs> hey, I praise the Lord he grew into that noggin right there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> terrible right there, man. We got, we, got, we got moving pictures. Kennedy, I, I got to ask you, though, man, first black coach in Carolina, how does that strike you? Man, it's, it's really something to see. I think it's, like I said before, it's a new look for us. It's an opportunity for us to go um, in a different direction. Um, I think that Coach Davis is, like I said before, a great leader. Um, he's won a championship with us, so he knows what it takes. He knows what it takes to get there um, while still playing within the Carolina way, and I think that he'll do a tremendous job. Hey, one thing, one thing before you guys get rolling. You see that goal that he had on? And, yes, sir. Uh, you know, that's what we're bringing back, brother. We need yes, that sir. gold back. You know what I'm saying? That real gold. Yes, sir. <laughs> right. Kennedy, you, you had the opportunity. You've spoken about, and we all uh, have heard for years about the Carolina family. And that family concept is something that you uh, carried with you from 
senior drive in Charlotte all the way to Chapel Hill in that uh, the West Charlotte family is a unique concept very much too. What do you think are, um, and now that you've seen it at West Charlotte and Carolina and won championships at both, what are the defining attributes, characteristics, and qualities of that West Charlotte family that might be similar to that Carolina family that defined those intangible experiences of the intangible qualities that only the people in those families understand yeah. and mm -hmm. make those cultures what they are? Oh, well, I definitely think um, yeah, it takes leadership. I think your leadership on both places has to be tremendous. And our leadership with Coach Williams at Carolina and Coach Terry at West Charlotte was very similar. Um, the way that we ran our practices and the conditioning and lifting weights and doing those type of things. Um, they all matter and they all translate to on the court. And I think the off the court is is just as as important as on the court. And um, both places taught me that. It was an opportunity for me to um, grow as a player on both places. And I think that I did that um, as far as what the coach asked me to do and um, the direction that they saw the team going. I want to ask you, uh, Kennedy, Give us a Roy Williams story. Give us that story that you don't tell a whole lot of people about coach, but it just comes to mind when you think about him and, and, and the type of person he was or is. I mean, it's, it's so many ways I can go with this, but um, one that I can think about most is um, I think that we're about to play Duke uh, the second time my junior year and um, we had a terrible practice before. We had like a, the worst practice that we ever had. And, um, he made us run um, 55s at the end of practice before the Duke game. Um, so we were kind of tired and we had the dead legs. And that just shows you that he doesn't really care about all the hype and stuff. He cares about his team being disciplined, doing the right things. And uh, he makes you pay if you don't. So. Yeah. How much has it hurt you to see Carolina the last couple of years? That hasn't looked like the teams that you played on. And obviously you won a national title there. Yeah, well, of course it's frustrating. I think that um, everybody has their own opportunities uh, presented from coaching those guys. And uh, it's about how you how you take advantage of it. And in the last couple of years, the guys haven't um, taken advantage of it as much as I think they could. They could. Mm -hmm. Um, because, like I said, it's such a unique place to be and the opportunities are endless and the weight rooms, the facilities and everything, the pools and everything you need is there. So I just feel like um, the teams now need to get back into the swing of things as far as recovery and take care of themselves and really watching film and looking at the stuff that they did wrong to translate over to the following game. Kennedy, um, when Langston and I were at school at Carolina, it was it was common knowledge that around September, all the former players came back to to Chapel Hill to get in shape. Mm -hmm. Whatever season um, they were playing in NBA, European, whatever, mm -hmm. and they would play against the either they would play against the 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 current team or they would have these pickup games, and sometimes it'd be players from even Duke and State will come over. Yep. Are those things still a part of the program when you have the world's greatest pickup games at Smith Center? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a real thing. It gets very competitive. Sometimes certain people are not going to play. They get upset and you got to deal with all that stuff. So um, it's <laughs> definitely one of those things where the championship teams usually get first dibs and get say-so about certain stuff. So Is there a lot of trash talking? Oh, of course. I think uh, I, I think Rasheed talks the most trash, but oh, I, I guarantee that after him is kind of pretty fair. So um, it's it's an exciting time for us for sure because we so look forward to Rasheed it. Rasheed is still over there playing. Oh yeah, absolutely for sure. He still got that like weird gray spot, don't he? Yeah, he still got a jumper too. For hey, he still got a jumper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I bet you he talks so much trash. That dude was yeah. great at it. Oh yeah, he's off the chain. You ever got the best of somebody in the Smith Center? Like you ever just dunked on somebody and you just let them have it? I mean, of course you had those moments, but not not one that I can really pinpoint. I just think that um, the biggest thing for us, especially with the teams that 
I play with in the pickup games is just to win as many games as we can. Mm-hmm. We can have bragging rights, we can talk junk, and we can, you know, go from there. So um, it's all about being competitive in that in that atmosphere that we have at Carolina, and I think that we all do a, a great job of giving back to our program and giving advice when, when it's needed. So, mm-hmm. Kennedy, what does it mean to you to see the forthcoming new West Charlotte High School campus? Mm -hmm. And what do you think it will mean? Obviously, there's a lot of talk going on in the community about with a new gymnasium uh, Mm -hmm. and keeping uh, future current and future generations immersed in the West Charlotte tradition. So Mm -hmm. obviously at UNC, you have the Smith Center and Williams Court. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of talk at West Charlotte about something being named after Charles McCullough yep. um, and on and on. Um, so how special is it for you to see a new West Charlotte campus? And what thoughts do you have on uh, any facilities names, whether it's the gym, whether it's the court, <laughs> whatever, in terms of ensuring that current and future West Charlotte generations are immersed in Lions lore as we see at UNC? Yeah. Oh, well, I think um, the most important thing is um, to give people their flowers that uh, is due. And I think Coach McCullough definitely made his imprint on West Charlotte basketball um, and our community. Um, I think that um, it's a great opportunity for us to have a new look at um, a, a different type of school. I think that having those new facilities that they're building is important uh, for our community as far as um, what it used to be and what it used to look like and um, being more welcoming and getting rid of the, the negative stigmas that we've had over the years at West Charlotte. And I think that um, everybody there is doing a tremendous job. You got Pat Williams who just went in the draft, who's um, very notable and and um, an honorable kid and uh, just those type of stories that you have. And um, I think that it all goes back to having that tradition and um as it's compared to like UNC. And Kenny, I think one way to help that tradition is for that man above you is to make West Charlotte win again. That would help uh, a good man, bit. Man, that's where yeah. it starts, man. That's right. Hey, hey, I just need I need a full year weight room with these kids. I need to the the teach them the squat. Man. It's all on you. It's on me. In two years, if it ain't if it ain't changed, if we ain't seen progress, go. then yeah. Yeah, See, because yeah. you also got to tap into that McDonald's All-American that won a national championship at the state yeah. university, you know, to come back and, you know, and, and pour into your children a little bit. I'm just saying. Yeah. We'll get off. And, and, and let's not forget, <laughs> let's, let, let, let's remember, too, West Charlotte class of 84. Uh, there are a lot of um, – uh, well, Here we go. Some from the West Charlotte class of 84. Who, That's when I graduated, kid. Who, who has distinguished to himself – who has distinguished himself <laughs> With the pen and the pad and the yeah. laptop, who, uh, who legendary. Certainly legendary. is. Man, I, I, I get it. How legendary that is. Man, I get it bad enough at, at all the time. Kenny, you are a rare dude, man. Not many people won state championships in high school and won a national championship mm-hmm. in college. Tell me what what it's like to to win it at the state, and then what it's like to win the Natty. Oh well, the state is like your first real taste of um, success and victory and um, everything that you work for paying off. Um, so that's where I kind of went with it my senior year at Carolina is just going back to those things, going back to um, working very diligently, um, giving my teammates all that I had to give um, because I knew that we, we had enough um, firepower to win the championship and it was all a matter of somebody stepping up and um, really making a difference. So that's what I tried to do that entire tournament is – one, did it make it? Did it make it better that year after Chris Jenkins hit that shot? I mean, I knew the air went out of you. Oh, when oh yeah, for sure. Well, I think that that was definitely a motivating factor for us. I think um, when we came back in the summer, um, nobody went home after the season. Uh, I think some people might went home for a couple of days or so, and then went right back to working out and working with Jonas and getting up shots and running with each other and doing all those things to. Uh, assure ourselves that we will be in the same position that, and it will be a different outcome. So um, I think that our senior class did a tremendous job of <clears throat> rallying everybody um, each and every day of practice and especially in a tournament to never give up on possessions and keep fighting and um, you see the outcome. So it was very yeah. important to us to, to back uh, Kennedy, what kind of 
relationship that you and Luke have, being that he was from Huff mm -hmm. and, and you were from, from West Charlotte, what kind of trash talking went on between the two of you and then with the two of you versus your teammates being from Charlotte? Oh, well, I think that, of course, uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that Luke uh, kicked me out of the playoffs my senior year, so yeah, he's got that one up on me um, for sure. Uh, so we joke about that from time to time. Uh, but us against our teammates, I mean, we always going to ride for each other, even though, um, I mean, I didn't really – people saw us as rivals in high school. I didn't really look at it that way. I looked at it as um, a young talent coming up and really – uh, making his imprint on our conference in high school. Um, and then it translated over to college, of course. So uh, me and Luke always got each other back, um, especially because we're from the same place. So. And Kennedy, one more question. Uh, it is a quantifiable fact that you, by having two of the seven all-time best, the fifth best and the seventh best rebounding totals in NCHSAA state championship history, 21 in 2012, and 19 in 2011. I didn't know that. To have your name twice, twice among the top seven all time rebounding performances since 1986. And, and the 19 was in the Smith Center. Yeah. So to have that and to be in a record book with the likes of Jason Parker with 38 points and 17 and 22 field goals in 99. We talk, we talk about West Charlotte lore. We talk about Charles McCullough. We talk about Jason Parker. We talk about Jeff McGinnis. We can go on and on. But to know that your name is there twice among the top seven in state finals, what does that mean as far as where you see yourself within the rich storied West Charlotte basketball lore? Oh, man, I, it was always a dream of mine. I mean, my entire family went to West Charlotte. Um, that's all I've ever known. Um, I used to go to all the games when I was younger. Um, so it's, for you to even uh, mention that is, is pretty crazy to me. I didn't even know that. That's a cool fact to know. And um, it all goes back to the work that I wanted to put in, the, the life that I wanted for myself. And it all um, started with hard work. Once I lost the weight and stuff, I think that, I was able to um, have different opportunities and a different outlook on my game. Um, but I definitely remember those two games. And there were a moment in my life where um, I just needed to um, show people my dominance, um, <clears throat> so that I can play on the next level, um, so that I can maintain myself and, and be a leader. Um, so that's all I want to do. Um, but those are, those are pretty cool facts, man. Yeah, absolutely. Kenny, last question before I let you go. Tell the Carolina faithful what they're getting in Hubert Davis and how long you think it's going to take him to get you guys back where you uh, are used to being. Yeah, well, I think Coach Davis is first um, one of the best um, people that I've ever met in my life. Um, I think he's an awesome father, someone that I um, hope to be one day. And um, I think that as far as coaching, he's competitive. Um, he doesn't <laughs> use any curse words. He's... Uh, a, a lot by the book, but he, he enjoys playing the game, he enjoys coaching the game, he enjoys um, seeing us win as a team. And I think that um, when Coach Williams retired, that's a, a perfect person for the job. Um, like I said, he has championship pedigree. He's had 1,600 points at Carolina. He's done all these great things, 12 years in the league. And he has the experience, so I think that he gives us a different outlook. I think that um, our players can relate to him. Um, I think that he is a uh, a great role model and father figure for um, those guys that's going to be there next year. And hopefully um, we get to where we need to be. I think that he's the great job, the great guy for the job. So, Absolutely. Well, man, thanks for coming on. Uh, Thank you, guys. Thank you. One of the best players in Mecklenburg County history, Appreciate Kennedy Meeks, that. McDonald's All-American, state champ, national champ. Hey, My you boy. You the Appreciate legend, you, man. man. You the legend. Appreciate it. All right, man. Take care, sir. Thank you, Kennedy. Yeah. Thank you, Kennedy. My wife was born in Seoul, Korea. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> when he said that. I, that's what rang a bell. I was like, oh, shoot. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All right. It's uh, time for the game show. We got my man, B.D. Waddell, the fifth. Not the fourth, but the turn, fifth. Turn, turn your <laughs> mic on, B.D., so we can hear you. What's up? 
Can you hear us okay? Can you hear us, Beatty? You got to turn your mic on. Yeah. He's frozen. Now I can hear I'm you. Keep talking. Up. Now I got you. I got, got you. you. We can hear you. Wait a minute. He's frozen. <laughs> log, log out and come back. Log out and come back. It's live TV. <laughs> He's really frozen. Look at that. Look at that face, boy. That's the face with defeat. I know, right? <laughs> He's like facing defeat in the game show right there. <laughs> he's like really frozen. <laughs> While we waited on him to come back, we're gonna take a look at the. Um... Go ahead, and tell me the first question so I can start. No, 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 no. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna take a look at when you why broke down the Why is Daryl gotta throw his two cents in there right there? No, <laughs> that's not fair. No. <laughs> Sam, you kind of Sam, you, you like what you saw in this young man, right? I did. I, I mean, not too often you see freshmen make an impact. And you see that he's making an impact. You tell he loves football. That's half the battle, like I said. You can tell he's the type of kid that's going to be in the weight room grinding. He's going to do everything he can to be a leader. Even though he's a young guy, he could lead the team down the road. All right, let's take a look. All right, Sam, we got another contestant on the pri- – no, it's not that show. We got another contestant today, B.D. Waddell of West Mecca. Freshman had an impressive game on, on – uh, Last Friday, said he's coming to get you. You're still undefeated somehow. I don't know how you do it. Um, straight strategy, brother. Not straight strategy. strategy. T- tell me what you're seeing on film with this young man. He's B.D. Waddell, Waddell the fifth. fifth. He's the son of the son West Mac rookie, rookie football coach. Football coach. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah, cool it's to see cool a freshman, see a freshman get really involved really with the team right now. And I think that, I think that you see that he see just loves just football. Loves when I watch film, Kenny got he's got a lot of things he can improve, but he's only a freshman. But here's the deal. Like you can tell he plays offense, he plays defense, he would punt for the team, he would kick for him, he'll do whatever it takes. He just loves football, and that's half the battle. And he's not scared. And so I think when I watch film on him, I think that's the most impressive stuff about him is just you can see his passion and love for the game. And uh he will be a stud down the road. It's just it's gonna take a little bit of time of weight room and developing the speed and things of that nature. But he's got a lot of high promising situations. You know, dad being the coach, he's going to push him really hard. I just think that it's very high upside for this kid, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I, I would imagine he has a pretty high football IQ too, growing up with a football coach. No doubt. No doubt. And the fifth, man. Look at that, boy. That's a strong line of beating right there. <laughs> and that's what I was saying. Uh, Absolutely. And the fifth is coming to be the first tonight. He's going to take you down on the game show. It ain't, ain't happening, man. When y'all... <laughs> Unless y'all go and tell him the answers before the game show, that's the only way he can win. All right, we'll find out. All right. Now, BD, you, you heard what he said. He said that you cannot win. What do you think? Can you beat him? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, yes, sir. I like that. It's it's a multiple choice question, BD. All you gotta do is pick the right answer. We're gonna start with Dale on the questions. Okay, boy, this is a tough one. <laughs> what song did number seven dance to? A Eeny Meeny by Justin Bieber and Sean Kingston. B You Belong with Me by Taylor Swift. C Somebody to Love again by Justin Bieber or D. Thrift Chop by Michael Moore. Be the you the way guy. You got to go. Um, let me see. I'm going to have to choose B. You're choosing B, Taylor Swift. All right, Coach, what oh, you got? That's Taylor Swift. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. I meant A. I'm sorry. A, okay. Coach, what you got? I'm going to say B. Ooh, Sam, you down in the hole today, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was ah, BD got it right. I, I was thinking, like, man, really? This is the first time in the in the series that Sam has been down. I was down one no. time. No, no you were never. I've been died. down. You I was down, versus, uh, died. I was down versus the Huff quarterback. You were tied with the Huff quarterback. You were never down. Down. You were never down. Kizzy. In the 1990s comedy In Living Color, what was the name of the clown Damon Waynes played? A, Hardy, B, Nomi, C, Baldy, or D, Homie? Sam. <laughs> All right, let me think here. Oh, here we go. Mm. I'm going to say Nomi. 
All right, B. B. What, you, what you got, uh, B? I'm at the go with D. D, D homie. As well. That's Ooh. right. Ooh. Damn, you in a big hole, baby. That's not good at all. What did y'all tell y'all gave this kid the answer? No, no, we didn't. Do that. no, we didn't. You this in the big hole. You're in the big hole. We'll have to go for two, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Damn. What was the name of Jimmy Butler's coffee shop in the bubble? Let me a, see your hands, Jason Sam. Let me coffee. see your hands. <laughs> I, ain't got no, I ain't got no phone B, here. Bubble Coffee. C, Big Face Coffee. D, Jimmy's Coffee. Look up, Sam. I'm, I'm reading the right. question. Can Beedy, I not read the Beedy, question? It's on you. Pick one. It's on you. <laughs> it's on BD. Yes, on BD. Oh, okay. Um... Man, this is a hard one. Uh, yeah. JB's coffee. coffee. JB's coffee. Hey, what you got, Sam? Golly, that's what I was gonna say, but I can't even answer that. Golly, say y'all need to ask him about if he's looking it on Google. Good <laughs> lord. <laughs> oh god, I wanted to say A, but I can't do it. Shoot, um, I'm gonna go with. Ah, shoot. So we got we got one eye closed and squinting. Just pick one, Sam. It's four choices. Pick one. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go with uh, mm, D. D. Jimmy's coffee. The answer is Big Face Coffee. So neither one of you got it right. Beatty's still up two to nothing. We have two questions. Two questions left. Oh boy. Right. Here we go. Run D. Here we go. First rap group to sign an endorsement deal. What companies did they sign with? A, Nike, B, Adidas, C, Reebok, or D, Converse? Sam. Hey, I think I, – let me think this out for a second. I think it's Converse. I'm just going to represent what I got on my shirt. I'm going to go with Adidas B. All right. Beatty. Nike. Nike? No. The answer is B, my Adidas. That was the song. All right, run. Uh, Sam is down two to one. Going to the last question. B, you can close them out. Dale. All right. What 2000 to 2010 Nickelodeon show is getting a reboot this year? A, Zoe 101. B, iCarly. C, Victorious. D, Sam and Cat. I've never seen Sam stand at the questions that hard. This is so hard. Like, I don't, I've never even heard none of those shows. Man's <laughs> go for two here, Kenzie, man. Kenzie's doing this to you. Kenzie's to your buddy. Bullcrap, Kenzie. I, run, I, mean, I, knew, I knew the last question. I was like the only one that was old school that I would have a chance. Like, this right here, Nickelodeon. Look, I don't come up with I was sitting here in high school in 2000. There's no way I, I didn't watch Nickelodeon. Well, that's disappointing. These are great shows. These are in preschool. Nickelodeon. You have little girls. I know they watch Nickelodeon. I, I was in high school at that time. It was the perfect time for me not to watch kids shows. Now, I I the girls that. probably watch it now. I watch yeah. kids shows all the time. All right, all right Sam. What, what's your answer? It's not on me. It's on him. Oh, it's Beatty. What's your answer, Beatty? He's frozen. He's I don't know. What's your can you, Beatty, what's your answer? He's thinking. I Carly. I Carly. Okay, what you got, Sam? That's just like what I was gonna say. God almighty. I can't say it though, because I can't I'll lose automatically. Um Kali, I was gonna say I Carly. Mm, I'm gonna go D, Sam and Cat. Just take a chance. Kids, we finally got him. We finally what got him. Beatty, you win. win. What was it? I called it. I, I knew it was, I, I couldn't win anyways. It didn't it matter. Did but how can you not get the right answer? Beatty, I just want to thank you so much. I didn't know what I wanted to guess. Good job, Beatty. Sam's ego has gotten so big in this game. We had to take him down. He's like 3 1 and 1 now, or 3 1 and 2. I was just so, dehydrated. 
So I appreciate you. Tell, tell us about Rest your season, man. Good. How's your season going? <laughs> I think he's I think he's frozen too bad. It's because he was using Google all the time. <laughs> he was using Google. Up. You know, he can't run two two servers right now. <laughs> hey BD, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, awesome. I mean, I I think I'm having a pretty good season. Um, I'm glad he can't talk yeah, we can't, right now. We, I'm glad. Get him out of here before he starts talking Beedy, to Beedy, we, we'll get you back on when you got a better connection. Might let you go now. We'll get you back on when you get a better connection, all right? But thanks for coming on, my man. Appreciate you. Make, make a video and talk some junk. Yeah, make a video. <laughs> make a video and talk some junk. Bad, bad that's, person. Uh, that's that's Beedy Goddell. I went down. I went down 0-2 from the jump. That hurt real bad. Yeah. He's smart I'm just disappointed you didn't, you didn't know who number seven was, Sam. Just mm -hmm. disappointed. I, I, probably really, you didn't, I, I really you didn't know who really, the I really was going to say – I was really going to say one of the Justin Biebers. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a shot. And I knew that iCarly was probably the answer, but I couldn't go with it because I would have lost anyways. You know, So I was like, shit. I just want to know why Dale always says Justin Bieber so disgusted. That's mm -mm. he's like uh, he's a very Christian guy now. He's I such a great guy. If I low key, if I met him, I might cry. Yeah, he's he's like <laughs> turning his life around a lot. Like his his songs don't have any cursing in it now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. All right, let me get the show back on the rails. Saturday, the brackets come out. Mr. Hughes, Mr. Expert, what's going to happen when the brackets drop on Saturday? It's going to be some really, 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 really good teams not make it. Wow. Um, so I want to know how they're going to – like, how do you not pick a Lake Norman, Hickory Ridge, the small 4A teams that are in big 4A conferences, and the only two teams they lost to are, like, the two stud big 4A teams? Well, they're not going to care who's big 4A and who's little 4A. That's what I'm saying. So, like, oh, 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 now, oh, hear, hear me out. Hear me out here real quick. What – there's you if you if everybody has conferences like us, okay. Say there's big four A across the board, and or it's a mixture of small four A and big four A. Most of the time, these small four A teams, unless there's just one or two schools in the whole deal that actually are going to finish first or second, it's always the big four A schools that finish first and second. How are you going to even have a small four A playoff? Is what I'm saying. Like if you can't put two of the better teams in there, which Hickory Ridge and and Lake Norman, that would that would be pointless to me. I so think there, there could be some teams that typically you might think of as big four or small four A teams or big four A teams be small four A teams because remember they don't go into the seeding process saying, all right, this is a big team, this is a little team. They're just going to do the qualifiers from top to bottom and then they're going to split it in half and then you have the big and little. Split. So you know right now it just doesn't matter. I mean it is what it is and, and just because of the limited number of the brackets. Like I said at the beginning of the segment, you're gonna have some really, really good teams just not make it. It's Gary, great. Gary, and you remember in 2005 when uh, but when Myers Park, yeah. who was what six and five going into the playoffs, they made it all the way to the they, they beat Richmond exactly, an undefeated team into the in in the old brackets as we were talking earlier. Yeah. They wouldn't have even made the playoffs. So that's kind of what Sam was driving at. You play in a bigger, tougher conference. But there's no waiting for any of that this year. Gary, what do you think of the repercussions of that? If you're a, you're a coach and you got to go talk to your kids, and you and Saturday comes out and you ain't there, it, it, it's tough because, like Chris said, they're gonna pick the top sixteen teams, and then they're gonna divide them by school population. So, um, it could be the 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 bottom eight teams <coughs> are. Have a smaller population, and the top eight teams have the big, um, the bigger population. You, you just don't know which way it's gonna go. But um, you know, everybody knew the rules going in. It was this is some of the complaints during basketball season about how it played out. And but you you had to do it this way to have a season and a playoff season, especially. Grace, I want to get your thoughts here. What do you think? 
I mean, it, it's terrible. Um, you have some coaches that have had phenomenal seasons. Uh, we had a JV game up at Lake Norman, and I you know, got a chance to speak to those guys. I mean, you look at a situation in which a team that already is competing you know, in a, in a neighboring county against some of the Giants, they, they actually beat Mallard Creek. They lost to only Vance and Huff this year. And we'll go into a situation at the, in the last week where pretty much between them, Glenn up in Kernersville, uh, Porter Ridge and Hickory Ridge, are, are kind of the teams that are right there on that bubble. And you're looking at one or two of those teams, which all of those teams have had a phenomenal year, but probably only one or two will get in. I think it's a situation clearly, and speaking very candidly, that the NCHSA didn't think we'd get to this point. I, I, it's no other way to look at it. You see with basketball, those situations in which games, you know, uneven games kind of created or predestined how the situation was going to go. With football, I think you're going to have a really big mess. And I think a lot of these teams – while they're giving opportunities to other teams outside of Charlotte, you're going to see the cream rise to the crop and no opportunity for any upset bids because the best teams that come out of here are going to be the best teams in the state and they're going to go to the championship. And then not having that first round, not having that first round playoff, we're kind of going right to the good stuff too. And, and Grice, it's, it's interesting you mentioned a team like Glenn who's going into this week at four and one. They've got a big matchup against East Forsyth on Friday. By the way, they played East Forsyth in week one of the season. He beat them eighteen to nothing. First time in about six years East had even had a shot uh, for failed uh, to score. And and East just kind of snuck into this group now, and I think they're three, four, and two. And nobody has spoke about East Forsyth. If East beats Glenn, which I think they've got the very good time to do so, and if West Forsyth, who's undefeated, defeats Davey, then all of a sudden Glenn's not going to make the playoffs. And a team like East Forsyth, who nobody has on their radar, who I think is peaking at the right time, they get in with a lot of momentum. Uh, you can get, a, get one of those teams get hot like Dale said at the right time, they make a run. Um all right, Senate Bill 548, Alex, came out uh, from three Republican senators, Richmond County, Idaho County, and Union County. Uh, they want to require that any organization chosen by the State Board of Education to, to be over, uh, to oversee interscholastic sports undergo a, a public audit every year. What are your thoughts about the bill, maybe what's behind the bill, and where do we go from here? Independent of what the bill motivating forces may or may not be, this whole situation is a matter of complete hypocrisy. Why in the world does the state legislature now want to undo what the legislature allowed to happen back in uh, 2008, 2009, right in that range, right before Charlie Adams retired as NCHSAA executive director? The NCHSAA was under the auspices of state government as a part of the University of North Carolina Systems Extension Division, and ultimately the NCHSAA reported to Extension Division officials at the Friday Center over uh, UNC Chapel Hill right down the road from the association's Finley Golf Course Road offices. So the association was a part of state government and the association was subject to uh, op opportunities being audited and having its books uh, checked, et cetera, et cetera, by state government. Uh, it's state government that precipitated the split of the association from uh, the university's extension division. And I know for a fact, because I remember very well that uh, my good friend, Charlie Adams, was resigned to the resigned to the fact that this was something he could not win. And that was very, very unfortunate because his good friend, Dr. Bill Friday, was ready to rally a number of legislators in this situation. Right now, brother, what's he up? Couldn't win. So uh, that being said, this is hypocrisy. Why do you want to undo something when the mechanism was in place for the state state government to have oversight of the NCHSAA. The, the, the uh, legislature or state government ultimately was involved in the disassociation of the NCHSAA from the University of North Carolina's extension division. And that's what precipitated all of this. Now, it was all about window dressing because the NCHSAA, per its operating mechanisms, had not cost state government a dime. But in the time of budget cuts, wanting to cut a position from the NCHSAA's then director level employees, 
led to this disassociation. So once again, this is total hypocrisy. Why do you want to audit something that was under your auspices and state government catalyzed the process by which the association disassociated from state government? This is total hypocrisy. Grace. I love I love Alex breaking it down. I mean, he always gets to a lot of the details. I think people don't really get to, um, you know, in my, I guess, Clark Kent occupation, I'm a CPA and I've been in auditing my entire career. I think it's great. Again, I, I do understand and, and agree with Alex in a lot of ways that the means to get there has, you know, some background of hypocrisy being how it started. But the point is, when you're in a situation like we were in, where you have a budget crunch by a lot of schools who depended on revenue from all of these big time sports and now don't have that money and are looking to the state who they've given money to faithfully over the years to provide assistance and not get that, there has to be some sort of repercussion. So the fact now that there is a requirement or there's looking to be a requirement with this bill that we have openness and transparency with our state legislating body, I think that's great. You know, I, I think that's a situation in which we're able to understand how they're operating, what they plan to do with the money and where, you know, things are going and where they're placing their efforts. In any situation, especially we're in, we're in something unprecedented like this pandemic, openness and transparency always will be something I look forward to. I'm all for it. Grace, I got to stick with you on here. You know, from the accounting side, you know, all I want is transit uh, transparency and and just to make sure that the monies are going where they need to go and schools are being helped. It's a public school. Public schools are funded by your state board of education and, and your state and your counties and your taxpayers. I just want transparency. That's all I want. So I'm not against the auditing. Now, I, I want to stand up and say, you know, I'm the first one that says that the NCHSA does a tremendous job at at managing the athletics of, of the game and, and, and teaching the correct values and everything uh, that goes along uh, with it. So I'm 100 percent in terms of the uh, of the association. But, you know, why not? If, if you're not hiding something, why not allow the state come in there and audit it and make sure that the monies are going? We're not talking about tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're talking about multi, multi, multi millions of dollars, 41, maybe even more uh, to be exact. Uh, so why not just make sure that all the, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed? I put up a letter from uh, Joe White, a former board of directors member, longtime coach in Charlotte. You know, he was appalled at the the actions of, of the politicians. Uh, Alex, your, your reaction to Joe's letter and just is this too political or do you agree with Chris and Grice? This is something that we need. Well, I want to echo what Chris and Jonathan have said. But first and foremost, the North Carolina High School Athletic Association is a model state governing body on the national level. There is a reason that the NCHSAA historically, perennially, is one of the 10 most financially solvent high school governing bodies in America. And that is exemplary leadership, visionary leadership. The endowment was the brainchild of Charlie Adams, who was the executive director from uh, July 1984 through January 2010 and was cultivated to a point where it carried on under uh, succeeding leaders. And we saw the uh, absolute efficacy of Mr. Adams's brilliance by this rainy day fund being ready during this pandemic when other reasonably financially solvent state associations were talking about possibly having to go into bankruptcy. So we all can agree on just the exemplary job that the association does. Now, that being said, I do question what the motives are in terms of why now? What is it that is so important now in a situation where we still are working to ensure that our students can return safely to 100% in-person learning, which is an ongoing process in which we all have to work together. We're in a situation where this pandemic has created uh, challenges for so many LEAs, local education agencies throughout the state of North Carolina some of which have opted not to field athletics teams this year. And why have they opted not to field athletics teams? Because their economic infrastructure needs within 
LEAs are so dire that athletics are less than secondary concerns to the general welfare and education of the boys and girls of North Carolina. So that being said, if LEAs are in that position where they're in such dire straits, why is the legislature so concerned with the athletics piece of it right now? In a pandemic, and furthermore, when the association was forced to disassociate from state government and you had the opportunity. So put all that together, exactly what are the motives here? Is this a matter of teams getting disqualified from the playoffs because of people disagreeing with ejections? Is this a matter of people who are uncomfortable with uh, certain leaders in certain capacities? Is this a matter of people who are looking to use young people and schools and use educational entities to placate voters because they feel their uh, rights to liberty right. have suppressed or taken right. during this pandemic? What no, I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying. We got to move on, but Grice, give me the last word, 30 seconds. Yeah, I think the biggest thing here is, I mean, you know, there are so many things, you know, places people can take it, and and I and I, you know, understand and hear what Alex is saying, and agree. The timing is, of course, pretty funny, but it's it's pretty simply this: we're in a pandemic, and again, when you restrict money, when you have an association telling you in your area, again, for public safety concerns, which I, I agree with, but they're restricting your revenue on purpose while not doing anything to support your expenses. You're putting me in a bad situation, so I need to be aware, or I need to understand that the money that you have. Have been receiving from me and are receiving every year that that money is going to something good because if you're saying that you can't provide financial assistance in the way that i need in my area and again you know some of us are in bigger leas some of us are in smaller areas that need help i mean i think of you know you go into the eastern part start heading down towards Dare county you know you see that there are people in dire need and so the nchsaa being a nonprofit organization is bound to support these areas these in these leas and the fact that they're not taking that time to do that that's going to require some sort of a. Yo, you're going to say it, man. All right, we got some good ones here. Hey, we're going east, man. Leesville Road. The pride of been putting, turning it on here. And Ethan Birchfield, the quarterback, is a big reason why. 6'3 senior quarterback. 13 of 17 for 146 yards and three touchdowns. This guy's not just doing it in the air. He's been doing it on the ground, too. Ran for 96 yards and two scores in a big win, 52-0 over Raleigh Inlow. For the year, his numbers are 782 yards and 10 touchdowns, and he's run for 305 and six scores. Sam, this guy hey, doesn't look like he's athletic on the on the surface, but he's been moving, and you can see them getting him out of the pocket. Uh, I, they really trust him. I agree. He's very precise. His, his completion percentage is unreal. And uh, that's probably kudos to his running game. It allows more people to be in the box. It means clearer reads. There's a little RPO right there. That's that Grice RPO right there. <laughs> you gotta love it. Let's move forward. Okay, this guy isn't too big. He's 5'10", 150, but what he lacks in stature, he makes up for in big-time football ability. Uh, caught 13 passes in his last game for 176 yards and a touchdown and a 43-38 win versus Southern Durham this past week. Wow. Guy's been a baller, mate. He has 42 catches this year for 687 yards and five touchdowns. I mean, he's got to be one of the leaders in the state in receiving yards. And I mean, even though, like I said, he's a smallish guy, this guy is a senior. I mean, looks like he has the you know, athletic ability, has the speed clearly to make big plays outside. And I don't know, it says 5'10, 150, but looking at this, somebody might be lying. He looks like a big guy. How in the world? If he's got over 600 yards, they let two guys run by him right there. Uh, yeah, you got to be looking at him. But, uh, I, only you know, got hey. this guy. I only got a little bit. Hurry up, Grace. Yep. Hey, with this guy, we got we to gotta look at the, you know, three three phases of the game here. You know, we love kickers, love the Vincent guy from Northwestern. We've got uh, the guy, Andrew Carter, oh, made good. a 44-yard field goal, had four punts for a 43-yard average and a 31-14 win for East Forsyth against Moxfield. Chris Hughes talked about him earlier. Y'all better watch out. East Forsyth is a sleeping giant. They're ready to come out and take small 4A again. But we move forward. Hey, our guy Joe Evans, man. Hey, you said the big win against A.L. Brown, which uh, a certain columnist has been in the game for a while, may have called. Um, 
But, you know, we, we know about the Nesbitt kid, uh, the older and the younger brother. Hey, let's look at Takamos from uh, South Met. Two interceptions and two pass breakups to go along with five tackles in a big 35-7 win over Barry. Joe Evans is doing a great job setting that standard over there and turning it around. Hey, Grounder, is a big defensive guy. We know Evans is an offensive guy, but it helps having a guy like Moss on your team. No doubt. Yeah, anybody named Moss can definitely play for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't care if you're cousin, brother. I don't care cousin, what brother, relation. Yeah, That's why I say we're going to find out. That gene pool is the truth. Yes. Right, we're going to find out. This last guy, I love it. Wait, everybody wonder where they go without Will Shipley? Kyle Parsons, uh, and uh, Lace has it wrong here. He is from Weddington. You see that green jersey. 135 yards rushing, three touchdowns, and a big 45-14 win over Monroe. Everybody wondered what uh, Weddington would do. They're going to still do what they do, and this is another uh, running back in the Weddington stable. Looks like he's going to be well on his way, and, you know, another big win for Weddington, who I'm glad to actually see them play this year. I think they have more uh, teams that uh, opted out for what, whatever various reasons uh, than have played them this year. So big-time win, big-time player here. Yeah, Catholic had the same problem. Catholic almost lost last night because they haven't tried to get I saw that tip game. play. That hurt. Ooh. But, hey, as we say every week, uh, hit up me. Uh, you see my, my Twitter name. Hit up Langston. Again, as we say every week, if you ball, you get the call out here on Grace's Gym. <laughs> That's right. All right. It's time for Go to the Corner. Here we go. All right, guys, uh, going into the final regular season week of this 2021 uh, spring football season, got some huge, huge football games on tap for uh, Friday night. Thursday night for some of them, uh, we got some showers coming through. And unlike any other week of the season, we can't push the games back to Saturday or Monday because of the playoff bracket. So uh, going to be a busy week for football. Uh, some of the biggest games here, uh, just to kind of touch on a few of them before we go into the Sweet 16. Uh, Huff and Vance, obviously, who doesn't know about that game? Uh, Providence, Arja Kell, we've talked a lot about that one in Twitter and, and on social media. Um, Harding, Barry, Independence, Myers, Mark, Myers Park, Crest, and Kings Mountain is going to be a huge one over there in Cleveland County. Um, a couple other ones that I just wanted to, to bring up, Pine Lake Prep and Community School of Davidson are going at it, uh, two uh, big-time teams. Uh, we can't forget about uh, Hickory Ridge and Porter Ridge. Uh, Grice touched on the importance of those two teams for the playoffs as well as the trio of games up in Forsyth County. Uh, you've got Davie County, West Forsyth, uh, Glenn, and East Forsyth that are going to have huge, huge impacts on the playoff guys. And then, Alex, I'll kick it to you. I know of a couple big games over there in the eastern side of the state. Uh, what are you tracking for this week? Well, certainly, uh, holistically, the magnitude of games in the East does not rival what you just the, the games you just outlaid. Um, I think um, this is an interesting week in the East. And what I, I just want to point out a few games very simply. Um, let's talk Cleveland and South Johnston, Enloe at Cardinal Gibbons, uh, Apex Friendship at Garner, Panther Creek at Riverside. I, I want to mention these four games simply because this week is a close the deal week. Let's go out, stay healthy, not, not, not run into any hiccups of any kind, and let's close the deal. That's the deal for these teams right here. As It's always an interesting week because, I mean, we're not dealing with conference championships for a lot of these teams, but you have to go through and make it official. You're so. right, Alex. You're right. And, and 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 this is also rivalry week for a lot of games. Obviously, you got some hardware up for grabs. Mm -hmm. uh, the Battle of the Bell, you can't forget about that. Playing A.O. Brown and Concord uh, Friday mm -hmm. night. Uh, you got a couple of big games in Eastern North Carolina that will have some magnitude. Havelock and Jacksonville. Uh, Northern oh, yeah. Nash and Rocky Mounts, a huge game right there in, in that region as well. Washington at Kinston. Kinston hadn't given up a point all year. I think that's, uh, you know, a huge storyline as well. And and the big game, uh, people forget about the Western North Carolina teams, but Robbinsville and Murphy are two of the absolute Always. dogs in one Always. day uh, going at it Friday night. And that will be a big one uh, up there at Big Oak Stadium. Absolutely. I'd like to give a shout out uh, to a Kinston team, including the uh, likes of uh, lineman uh, Nick Harvey, um, who is uh, <clears throat> Nick Harvey the third, who is among the top class of 2022 linemen in the state. 
uh, Mr. Harvey is um, number one academically in Kinston High's class of 2022. And Mr. Harvey has been accepted to governor's school this summer. Yeah. So uh, cool. tr tremendous opportunity in terms of just persevering through the pandemic. So, so many wonderful student athletes we can spotlight. Um, at one point in time, I I'd have to go back and uh, clarify this information to make sure it's completely timely. But um, Nick Harvey III had nearly as many college credits through a, a, a dual enrollment opportunity that Lenore County offers college credits already as high school credits. Wow. So, good, uh, good it's, for him. It's so, so great for him. Uh, number one academically in Kinston High's class of 2022, obviously playing for a team that hasn't given up uh, a point this season and on the way to governor school in science uh, this summer. So, so many great stories coming out of these times and uh, opportunity for he and the Vikings to close out the regular season and keep going forward. Well, before we head up the sweet, second Sweet 16, the Raleigh Sweet 16, uh, a couple questions for Dale and Kinsey. Uh, Kinsey, first, uh, the big game, Huff and Vance, I hear that you're gonna be calling that game on the, on the live stream. With the students not being in school, is the hype still there? I know social media is its own animal, but what's the hype within the student bodies getting ready for that game? I think social media has kind of done it all. You know, both teams have been talking. They're going to keep talking. So, you know, I think social media has played such a big part. Um, you know, the fans are so excited. Kids, you know, are real fired up. Uh, so you also go back to school the next week, so you don't want to go back to school right after a big loss. So uh, that, that may be, play a big role in that. Well, um, and, and just to throw it out there, throw the plug out for you, you will be doing the play-by-play -play for the Huff Vance game. On um, What's the platform again? D1 Media Pro on NFHS Network. Well, I just want to say it right here. I, I will be glad to say I knew you before you made it big. Uh, Dale, you and I have both seen Kings Mountain this year. I've seen bits and pieces of Crest. They dominated Burns last week. Uh, Crest has an insane running game. Uh, but Kings Mountain's pretty tough, too. What do you think of that big battle? Well, you know, that's – a huge game. It's not just for first place and it's not just two undefeated teams. This is a huge rival, uh, as big a rival as, as any you'll come across. So uh, I think this has the opportunity to be one heck of a ball game and probably a larger crowd than what we saw. Uh, <laughs> when we, when we got to see that Kings Mountain game. Uh, Chris can put some uh, fans in, but I think that's going to be a great football game the question uh i would have there is is king's mountain at full bore but uh yes. I, I would love to go to that game but i'm gonna go see rice and um uh sam go at each other all right uh well let's go ahead and run the uh second sweet 16 and then we'll transition over to the raleigh news and observer sweet 16 uh so we want to roll that up there uh here we go coming in at 32nd pine lake prep i mentioned them they've got that huge game against community school of davidson you see them down there listed as a bubble team uh bunker hill can't talk enough about them i know during our private chats i, I mentioned that i thought that coach clark there at bunker hill should be uh uh thought of as one of the coach of the year candidates. Uh, J.M. Robinson had that big loss to Kannapolis last week. Thomas Jefferson, Ash County, Porter Ridge, Statesville. Statesville's got a huge game going against Western Oan for the North Piedmont Championship Friday night. Uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, they just continue to dominate both offensively and defensively. They play West Stanley, who's also, you see them listed down there. Uh, A.L. Brown, I mentioned them. I always skipped over Mallard Creek, and I still agree that I would not want to play Mallard Creek. They could probably beat most of the teams here and probably some teams in the Sweet 16. Uh, Burns, they got the big game with Crest. Shelby's got a big game coming up. Uh, South Point, RS Central, Chase. That All four of those teams right there from 18th to 22nd are in the same conference, and it's a shame that only two of them are likely going to make the playoffs. Uh, Watauga sitting in there five and zero. Uh, again, we got some good bubble teams: uh, West Lincoln, West Stanley, Monroe, Salisbury, East Lincoln, Alexander Central. Uh, there's a lot of good football still being played here in the Charlotte region, and uh, I'll let you transition over to the Raleigh um, region as well uh, when we get the graphic up. Uh, any any surprises there, men and Kenzie? I'm sorry. You're good. My surprise is that Olympic didn't drop down into that group. Quite honestly, other than that. Watagas 
stepping I, up. I think Olympic, though, considering how they've played and, and, the, and the Ardra Kell win, I just think that their body of work is still really, really good. Uh, here we look at the, the Raleigh News and Observer Sweet 16. Uh, Rollsville again coming in number one. Cardinal Gibbons, Cleveland. Apex Friendship had a big win, 63-42 over Millbrook. Uh, Panther Creek had that big win over Pittsburgh Northwood. Um, Heritage, they've got the big matchup Friday night against Wake Forest. Clayton, Middle Creek comes in at 5-1. and one. Princeton at 6-0. and oh. They're going to be a dominant force in the uh, 1A brackets in the playoffs. Uh, Hillside, Chapel Hill, Grice, we saw your, your highlights at Chapel Hill. I do think this is a team uh, that continues to improve. Uh, Southern Durham, Millbrook, Leesville Road, uh, sitting there. Remember, Leesville Road made the state championship a year ago. Uh, they could be a problem in the playoff bracket as well. Holly Springs. Uh, some good good football still being played in Raleigh. Yes, uh, very much so. And li like I said, uh, fortunately, I, I think it could be an advantageous situation for Heritage or Wake Forest to have a sharpening opportunity this week heading into the playoffs, which is quite a contrast from the other games that we mentioned in Wake County where the, the quest is close the deal with no injuries and get ready for the playoffs. So uh, it could be an advantageous situation for that Heritage Wake Forest game. But uh, other than that, in the greater triangle area, close it out with no injuries. And, and I think you'll see some back and forth, if not watching, but there'll be some uh, attention paid to scoreboards because with it predetermined certain conferences in the East and certain conferences in the West and how large and small some of these qualifiers are could really throw a monkey wrench, unlike even last year in this whole situation. The possibility of, and, and we, we don't have the numbers in front of us, but the possibility of someone like a Butler in the West being in a small 4A bracket or the possibility of, I know Heritage has been borderline in years, who knows what's going to happen there? I mean, there, there are too many scenarios that there will be some attention paid to scoreboards as these teams try to close it out because of the unpredictability of this. All right. Good deal. I, th I definitely agree with that. Definitely. By, everybody's going to be watching the scoreboards to see who gets in and whatnot. But we know what time it is. It's Kenzie time. Tell me who you interviewed. You know, we're back on the bus. You know, big win over uh, Olympic. Mason Atkins, tight end, plays a really big role in this offense, um, on the offensive line and catching the ball, whatever he can do to help make it work. Definitely. Let's check it out. Roll the clip. Mason, you guys had a big win against Olympic last night, twenty to zero. How was that game for you and your team? Well, it was it was pretty cool. You know, they were obviously talking junk all week, and you know, we talked with the score twenty to nothing, man. I think that you, as a tight end, one of the most crucial skills that that position is blocking, and you've really embraced that. Um, why do you embrace it so much? Well, you know. Our, our offensive line coach emphasizes it's like something you you want to do like you got to like pull it out of your you got to pull it out of your heart and you know um that game depended on us you know if we wouldn't have won up front we wouldn't have won that game that was a pretty stout defensive line and we dominated and getting to this season um as a senior i know it's been difficult um does that make the success that much sweeter Oh yeah, you know we worked all off season, quote unquote, and uh, we practiced in the dark when nobody saw us, and it's starting to pay off. And most importantly, Providence is six and zero for the first time since two thousand three. To put that in perspective for everybody, that's the year I was born. Um, so, congrats Good. on that accomplishment. <laughs> um, moving forward, what are you guys looking to do in the playoffs? Well, we just gotta think. Had the mindset of one and zero each week. You know we can't be thinking about 
like who's next, who's next, who's we battle with. We just got to think about them. Want to know every week. Yes, sir. Now to a fan favorite. We're going to the speed round. Mason, what's your favorite movie? Oh, man. <sighs> Probably be an old Western like Tombstone. I like those old Western movies. All right. What's your favorite TV show? You know, I don't really watch TV, but I guess when I was little, I always used to watch like Duck Dynasty or one of those TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what's your favorite food? Yeah. Their food would have to be steak. What's your favorite color? Color, black and gold, baby. Oh, the Providence colors. What's your favorite oh. singer or band? Well, you know, Riley Green's pretty good, like Holland said, but like I like classic country music. So like Waylon Jennings and all those old singers, they're pretty cool. I like them. You know, I got a side with Holland. Riley, Gre Riley Green's my guy. Uh, if you were a superhero, yeah. where, who would it be? Superman. <laughs> and if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would it be? Um, Probably the Badlands and the Dakotas. Sweet. I like it up there. It's pretty cool. All right. Thank you, Mason, for coming on. Really appreciate it. <laughs> that was a cool dude. Yeah, yeah, y'all yeah, have some chemistry too. Oh, a good player. <laughs> Bryce, Bryce, I got it right when you weren't here last time. No All pressure. Right. No Maybe pressure. Tyler Hoff. T. Hoff. Man, this kid's got it all. Committed to Western Carolina recently. Uh, his run and catching abilities is incredible. Great route runner. Um, he's super reliable, too. Not going to see him drop a lot of balls, fumble a lot. Um, he's really brought a lot of senior leadership to a team that's lacking seniors, and that's probably one of the most crucial abilities that he's been able to bring to the table this year. I, I, I uh, they ought to call this guy Bugs Bunny. He's got a lot of real speed there. James Pierce out of Vance, Alex. P is for Pierce. Last year, P is for was for power, and Pierce has power. At 6'5", 220 pound frame, able to go on both sides, whether it's at wide receiver, whether it's at defensive end and the way he can line up as that dual threat. Like I said, P is for Pierce, and P is for power. Last year, the name was Power, and this year, soul power is in the form of James Pierce. Gary, Milan Summers out of Greensboro. Milan Dudley. Summers out of Greensboro, Dudley. 5'9", 190, running back, linebacker. As you can see, if the sun moves, uh, he's a home run hitter. Big play type guy. Um, kind of reminds you a little bit of um, Warwick Dunn. Uh, of, wow, that's, that's a that's how I compliment. We're gonna move on to East Side. Jamon Smith, Chris. Uh, Jamon Smith is a powerful, and I mean powerful runner. He's a beast. Look at him able to run between the tackles, uh, get out in space, and boom, he's gone. He's got an extra speed. You can see right there the R.J. Reynolds defenders had nothing for him. Uh, he is getting good at the right time. Well coached by Coach Todd Willer and that staff. Proven winner. Look at him right here out of the spread formation. I love that he can get in there and, and go. Uh, that's out of the Wildcat right there. Woo. But I'm telling you, this young man, I think he rushed for 256 yards last week. He, he, he He's a next-level player, uh, and I think he's going to help propel East Forsyth into the playoffs. Ethan Rhodes, Grace, out of Maiden. Man, QB out of Maiden, Ethan Rhodes, six, I think about six three, two hundred. Big frame, kid with a strong arm. I saw he actually has against Newt Conover, had a sixty yard pass. I mean, kid with a very big arm here. You see good footwork in the pocket, knows when to leave the pocket. And again, he's got enough speed to where, hey, if he can get needs to get a few yards and he's got the power, he's looking to run you over. He ain't necessarily looking to go around you. <laughs> Maiden the best any, football any player plays, in there. Any plays defense. Hey, look, yeah, like like that. Jordan DeMornay out of Western Alamance, Alex. Jordan DeMornay. Look at what we have right here. Just once again, 
being able to get wide and use that speed and use what I like you see here is superb vision. We mentioned Warwick Dunn earlier and a defining attribute of Warwick Dunn was that vision. You see the vision right there in terms of reading the block and knowing whether to make that cut back inside or make that cut back wide. Vision is what I like to see and what I like. Woo! Jack Crump out of Monroe there. Yes. Yeah, he's a 5'10", 190. He plays both sides of the ball. Very good defensive player. Might Ooh. be a little undersized for defense, but good running back as well. Uh, he, can play, he can play for me. That dude on the side. Yeah, he's yeah. got yeah. he he speed oh, huh. and reaction to the ball, yeah. Tim Winters, our friend in Union County football, says he's the best player in Union County. He's he good. I pray. He's good. Yeah, yeah. If Tim says it, I believe it because Tim knows Union County like no other. He's a special yeah, player. Exactly. He's got speed, talent. Look at that. Yeah, one of those multi-positional Union County dudes that, you know, that they just have in, in Monroe. Sam, here's your guy, Elijah McWilliams, out of Huff. You asked for him. A.K.A. Mookie coached him at Hickory Ridge. This is probably the most underrated running back in the entire state. The guy gets downhill. He's extremely fast for his size as well. Like, he, he hides behind the offensive line. He's very short in stature, but he has a great burst, and you're going to feel his weight. He's about 200 pounds. You're going to feel it the entire game. He's really, really good at what he does, can catch the ball to the backfield, blocks hard if he needed to block, but he just keeps his legs turning. So he breaks a ton of tackles, and he can go 40, 50 yards. I like this kid a lot. Very tough, underrated kid. I think he should get, you know, the Western Carolinas of the world scholarship uh, definitely coming soon. Is he one of those kids that's going to have a chance to maybe make a, a you know, a couple big runs against Vance and, and keep that game close? Yeah, he's good. He's good. What they need? He's so physical of a runner. He's strong. Kick and power clean by 300 pounds. He squats, squats in the 500s, like deep. Like he's a very strong kid, and he works out hard. His dad's pushed him really hard his whole life, and I think he's ready for the moment. So he's going to be a tough one to stop. He, he's really good. All right, it's time to go back to the corner, see who made the Sweet 16 and who got jumbled. Here we go. All right, uh, like we mentioned, uh, going into the final week of the 2021 spring regular season, here comes this week's Sweet 16. Obviously, uh, no question, uh, number one, number two teams, Vance and Huff, uh, they're going to go at it Friday night. We've mentioned it, a uh, huge game. Uh, you'll see right here, Richmond has moved down, uh, and, and that's something that we, we've had, had a lot of discussion about. Do you want to go into a season rested, or do you want to go in hot with a lot of experience? Obviously, they can't control the effects of the COVID that they've dealt with. Uh, so it's not a matter of thinking less of Richmond. It's just, hey, they, they, they're they rusty. They haven't played. It's just kind of a wait and see approach. And you've seen Weddington keep on winning. They're five and oh now. Myers Park, uh, they, they keep on winning. Uh, so that's kind of what it is. Butler's right there. I think Butler is as good as anyone. Uh, so, you know, we, we kind of mentioned that they go small 4A. Man, that could be a whole lot of trouble for a lot of teams. Uh, Crest, Kings Mountain, they're going at it Friday night. Catholic, we saw them. They're now four and one. Uh, Providence, High Brighton, Olympic, Ardra Kale, Maiden, Lake Norman, and Hickory Ridge still there clinging on. Uh, incredible teams. You know, unfortunately, I think some of these teams, like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, are not going to make the playoffs. And, and that's just a byproduct of the, the COVID shortened season that we're living in right now. Uh, but again, it, it's some incredible football being played here in Charlotte. Chris, I tell you what, I don't want to play like Norman. And I don't want to play Butler. That's just me personally. I, I don't want any parts of those, those, those guys. No, not at all. Yeah, I, think those, I think those are going to be really tough. No one wants to play teams that are really good in the trenches. They can just overwhelm you physically, and Lake Norman's really good at that. Butler's always been pretty good at that, and they're really good, especially when they get pissed off. They're, <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> Ever since that Myers Park yeah. game, Butler's been a different bunch. They've uh, they really kind of figured it out. Stone, their defense coordinator. I think Myers Park is just better than people are giving them credit for. I think, I think you got to give Harmon a lot of credit. If I had to vote for a coach of the year right this minute, I would probably lean hard to Harmon. I, I think uh, to lose oh, Drake May and to lose all, you know, four, four college think, guys to college and five transfers is pretty impressive. I understand. I think I understand. The is Myers Park changed their identity from what we expected them to be. Oh, no, they're a running team now. They, yeah. they, yeah. they flipped it. Yeah. Last year, you know, it was 400 yards a game in the air, and now it's – 
250, 300. Yeah, they, they win a lot of 14-7 games instead of 50 to 7. So yeah. You you like that. That. All right, it's time to go to gloom and doom. Here we go. Basketball. Man, I don't know any way around it. We really got some gloom and doom this week, beginning with this first one right here. The fact that one of these has to go. Summer break, winter break, or spring break. Kenzie, start us off here. I, I, I want to hear which one of these has to go. None. It's not plausible. My brain cannot work all sections of the years. I need breaks. Like on the way to spring break, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> so none of them can go. It's just not from, it's not, I wouldn't survive. All right, Gary, you've been in the classroom, you've coached in the fall, you've coached in the winter. You've seen it as a retiree uh, substituting summer, winter, or spring. What's going on? Summer. Um, after two, maybe three weeks of summer, you get bored. You know, you're looking for something else to do. As I said earlier, when I first joined this program, we are not an agrarian society anymore. These kids do not need to be out of school for 12 weeks. Um and then go back in, in late August. Um, we need to get to a year-round schedule. And now I'm with Kenzie. Even as a substitute, I was ready for spring break. But uh, summer break is not necessary anymore. Yeah. I kind of agree with that. I'd like to see a shorter summer break and have four breaks in the year. Uh, especially for the older kids so that they can start adjusting to that life of having to keep um, uh, attending so or, or keep working. So, yeah, I, I would get rid of the, the summer break. And I'll, and I'll jump in on that as well. Summer break may as well, simply because of what Gary said. We're, our, our educational framework still is on a 19th century model right now. And 21st century learning requires uh, mechanisms in integrating technology and other resources by which will contribute to students retaining and achieving at higher levels with a shorter summer break. And I think we have a lot of support for that. So summer break's got to go. Uh, moving right along here, qualifying for the postseason, max preps rankings, preceded brackets, or random seeding one to eight, kind of like we're going to see here. What's going to go, Gary? Uh, the one to eight random seating, it's going to be so many people upset on Saturday. And I've always already witnessed this in basketball season. There are going to be some furious teams and coaches, and it's going to be people putting in complaints and one bracket is going to come out. And then two hours later, they're going to release another bracket. You may see a team like Vance. That's the number seven seed. Can you imagine that Vance being a seven seed? So um, that's the one that's got to go. It, it was necessary in order to get a uh, reduced season in place, but uh, you can't do that one long term. Kenzie. You know, I agree with Gary. I'm glad he's come back. He's re like re come into our society. He's not, you know, with that old year round school stuff anymore. So I agree with, I agree with Gary. <laughs> Deal. I don't like any of them, but uh, the, the one to eight has got to be the worst, and it's not even close. <laughs> Let's make it unanimous here. There, there's just too much uncertainty with it. I mean, we, we, we can say that Cream rose to the top when Independence uh, football was seeded third one year, and when it was like a three or four time defending state champ, it still was seeded third, and, and they still went on to win the state title. But this this one to eight random seating, as Gary said, was out of necessity and that it cannot exist uh, into perpetuity with it being random like that. So now that's got to go uh, make it unanimous. Uh, a COVID attendance restrictions looking ahead to the 21, 22 year. Do you have to show a proof of a vaccine? A thousand tickets first come first serve or on site sales only? 650 at home, 350 visitors. Which one's going to go? Dale, start us off. I think out of all that, I don't, I, I like least the 1,000 because you're not giving an opportunity for 
home and visitors uh, to attend. It, you could have all uh, visitors if they happen to be the first ones there. So I kind of don't like that one. Kenzie. I think the proof of vaccine has to go. I said it last week. I'll say it again. Uh, these are high school sports. These are high school kids. Uh, they're minors. You can't make medical decisions for yourself. A parent makes that. And so when you look at it that way, if you aren't going to allow kids to attend because their parents won't let them get vaccinated, I think that's dumb. Gary. Uh, I think the 1,000 tickets, first come, first serve. Uh, you might end up for, like, for example, you got the big van. Huff game this week. If you if the public were allowed to buy tickets randomly like that, then you'd have people camping out, and it would defeat the purpose of uh, the COVID restrictions. You'd have people lined up, you know, trying to get these tickets because there's only a thousand available. So I think that's the one that has to go. Now, some of the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree with Kenzie that the uh, the uh, vac proof of vaccine, proof of vaccination has to go and very succinctly. I think there could be some legal issues with that, uh, whether we're crossing over to religious considerations, whether we're crossing over to familial considerations. Uh, I, I think there could be some legal challenges there. Not saying it's right or wrong, but the door would be open and someone would jump on that. So uh, I think that has to go. And uh, lastly, uh, speaking of uh, legal issues and sports and politics, which one is going? Kneeling before the anthem, moving sports in, from, in, in terms of venues and locales because of rules or protest symbols on uniforms to raise awareness. What's going to go? Let's go to Gary first. Uh, I think the protest symbols on uniforms to draw awareness. I think throughout the college season, football and basketball, you saw uh, numerous college teams wearing different slogans on the back of their jersey, like unity and togetherness and love. And then some of them had a patch. But I think, you know, this weekend kind of showed me with the final four, the teams had a little symbols on a uniform and the announcers never said anything about it you know so what kind of awareness is it if the announcers never say anything about it i think it it wore out after the first week of the season um and so that's the one would have to go for me protest symbols on the uniforms uh i think the other two um you know kneeling it gets your attention right away uh, and then I think moving sports events from various locales, I always say, follow the money. It, if people find out they're going to lose money because of a political decision they made, they will adjust their decision long term. Maybe not short term, but long term. If it's costing a lot of people money and power because they may lose an election, uh, it gets their attention. Yeah. Gary, I agree with you on the on your last point there. Moving, that's one of the people's voice when it comes to uh, politics. That's one of the voices we actually have. Like you say, follow the money. For me, uh, I, th I thought about this, and when I looked at it, I thought about the, uh, I'm a big uniform guy. I like uniform, uh, so uniformity with the uniform. So I don't like the different kinds of socks and things that we see out of some uh, kids. And uh, if, if if this is applied to high school, is it going to be every person uh, on the team that has that same emblem, if, uh, if it be? Uh, I think out of the three, that's the one I would get rid of is the uh, emblem on a uniform. Kenzie. I would get rid of the emblem on the uniform. Uh, my eyesight's not very good. Half the time I can't even see it. So if I didn't know it was there, it would just be, you know, a little like splotch. So I, I think it's the least effective. And once again, I'll make it unanimous here. The uh, protest symbols on uniforms have to go. I'm a uniforms guy too, like Dale and everybody else. And the fact uniforms define 
what bring us together. A protest might bring us together, but something is not necessarily a message that is in line with the written mission of a particular school and therefore cannot be deemed as sponsored by the school. And if that's the case, then that eliminates the importance and vitality of uniformity. So okay. however, however well-intentioned the message might be, it's not uniform and often not sponsored by the school, which eliminates uniformity. And so that's not the place for it. All right, Gary, do you have a final thought? You raise your hand. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say uni means one. And, you know, back when they started wearing all this pink um, for breast cancer awareness, I think the NFL started it and it filtered down to the colleges and the high school. When I was at Hopewell, we were the first high school to have a pink uniform. Mm. And uh, I I remember. it was the same. Everybody had the same uniform. It right. was pink. We only wore two or three times a season, but um, you know, when, when you have a uniform, that means one. So everybody should be just like, all right. All right. All right. Uh, we got a lot of messages, people waiting on this high school Heisman list. So we're going to get to it. We're going to let Chris break it down. We're going to go to coach versus coach. I'm going to get out the way and let the boys have their fight and tell you who's who they picked for their Sweet 16 high school Heisman watch list. We're going to whittle it down every week. We're going to get the three finals, invite them all on the show, and let Sam tell them who won. We had a good time in the in the was the fall and winter with the, the private school kids. Then we had two. We should have had on our like suits and stuff for the last. Yeah, a little bow tie. Yeah, a little bow ties. Here, here we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Isn't it crazy that we got Meeks to come here and his his little hype video was like legit, and then me and Grice is just still bubblegum stuff, right? Now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we got we got to we got to win an Addy. That's all. That's all it that is, I guess. Well, hey, um, we're going to talk about some incredible uh, young men, some great football players. We've had a lot of discussion over the past two or three days and getting this watch list of the the Heisman. Um, players from across North Carolina. And, you know, one thing I think is important to note, uh, and, and uh, Sir Alex uh, brought it up over our texting as well, is that this list encompasses players from every single region of North Carolina. So we have it loaded up on Charlotte guys or Raleigh guys or Fayetteville guys or whatever. So I think that that is a really good point to, to, to list for these players. Uh, but let's start that right there. Wade Jarman, a quarterback from Greenville Rose, Tate Carney, uh, running back from David County, Tad Hudson, quarterback at Huff, Jacob Newman, running back at Myers Park, uh, Javari Rice Wilson, the defensive end at Kings Mountain, uh, Marion Hampton, running back at Cleveland, uh, Varian Cole, the linebacker at Vance, uh, Dylan Summers, uh, Smothers, I'm sorry, running back at Vance. Uh, wow, those, those are some, uh, some hard hitting and some really nasty players, guys. And I'll let you guys start commenting on this list before we break it to the other side. Well, that, I'm a strictly a defensive guy this year. I think the MVP is going to probably be a defense guy. The one offensive guy that's really impressed me is Jacob Newman. Jacob Newman is like – there's games where he's carrying the ball 29 times a game and getting 200 yards roughly. Then then he'll go the next week and get 23 carries for 180 yards or something. So that's very impressive. You're talking about putting the load on his back. He's very explosive. He looks like he could play outside linebacker as well. Um He's very impressive because I think he helps the defense as well as much as he carries the football. And then I would go with the Javari Rice, Kings Mountain, and then the linebacker Cole from Vance. I just I, I'm really big on the defensive guys this year. I think they're making a huge impact. Yeah, I mean I, 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 I get it. I think it's a lot of guys on here that that have done some great things. Tate Carney, a former Grice's gym. Hey, Coach Vaughn, the OC and O line coach, I talked to a lot up there. He's an area guy like me. But one thing is, if you got a running back like he has, got to put it put up eight touchdowns in a game. You got to have him on this list. So he's one that's great. Uh, another one I'll point out again. You know, I'm not a defensive guy, but I tell you this right now: if Varian Cole's name was Power Echoes, he would already won it. We'd be having him on the show tonight, handing it to him. He has done a phenomenal Power Echoes impression in the Hackett's defense. Coach Hackett calls him the MVP of his defense right now. 
And I think the problem is people don't know him or he doesn't have that name brand recognition like Power Eccles has. But his level of play this year has been on par with Power Eccles. No doubt. No All doubt. seriousness in the world. And I think he's done a fantastic job. Smothers, of course, is I, he, he's a phenomenal back. His stats don't even show up because I don't think they have enough time for him to actually be in tight ball games. But again, as young as he is, he's one of the most talented guys we've seen in a little while here at running back. No kidding, guys. Let's go to the script and look at the other half of the state. Uh, there you see John Ballas, the linebacker of Providence. Byron Brown, the junior, by the way, junior quarterback of Rollsville. Brady Whitson, quarterback of T.C. Robertson. I watched him for, for 450 and a ton of touchdowns against Dale Brown in the playoffs last year. They lost that game, but I think he just threw another one as good as he was that night. As a kind of movie running back at Eastern Guilford, this guy is a man. I'm going to tell you what, he is a beast. I think he may be the statistical leader for rushing in the state of North Carolina right now. Uh, Trey Sack, Ty Saxby, I should say. He's the coach's son, uh, Terrence Saxby, uh, up at Hertford County. Uh, incredible uh, program. That team's been through a lot this year, and he has guided them back 4-1. Uh, and one. Um, They should be a force in the playoffs. Dawson Cox, another one of those air raid quarterbacks that just puts buku numbers up there at Ash County. And Travis Shaw, linebacker at Grimsley High School. Uh, man, that's some good, good looking football players right there. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's some great guys here. I mean, I, I like that you put out Hertford County, Murfreesboro. One of my roommates I uh, was from uh, Hertford County, went to Hertford County High School, so I had to shout him out. But, hey, you better be a coach's son with that stat line of 14 touchdowns and two picks. Dang sure if your dad's a coach and you throw an interception, you're going to hear about that all the way home. So I think I like that. He's probably one of the guys that has thrown the ball quite a bit, but has thrown probably the fewest interceptions there. Dawson Cox, I think it's hard to get these Western North Carolina guys because, Brian, there's been snowing up there, man. I talked yeah. to Coach Piscopo, and he said it was a game was 29 degrees and snowing up there. It's hard for him to get numbers. So the fact that he's got numbers enough in, in tune with a lot of these guys shows how good he's played this year. And, and and I love, like, uh, even on that list, I love the two defensive guys, too, because, like, the guy from Providence, I mean, he is a physically strong specimen that destroys people, and he's one of the reasons why they're doing so well. And then you also have the kid from Grimsley. I mean, that kid's pretty daggone good. He's going wow. – he's got a lot of colleges after that guy. But the last will be uh, – the last thing there, did you see that clip of Ballas tracking down Cam Smith from behind? Like, Dude, you know, talk about how strong he is, but that's fast. Cam, I've known Cam Smith for a long time. And he can run. Like, he can run sideline to sideline. He's legit. Like, he's that was amazing. Oh, Keekly. His name should be John Keekly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he's dope. I love it, too. Oh, well, Coach Griner, since you're in the middle, you're going to get first crack at this question tonight. Coach versus coach. Let's hit it round one. Uh, which area of the state is playing the best brand of football? Raleigh, Charlotte, Greensboro, where, why? I'll give it to you first. It's not even close. I mean, it's Charlotte. I know that we're a part of Charlotte, but there's too many good teams. There's really, really good teams that would be undefeated in Raleigh or somewhere else that have two losses. And you can't say that anywhere else. Um, you know, you got Richmond County and things like that that only play three games, but you got guys in Charlotte like Huff and Vance. I don't think anybody in the entire state can come close to beating one of those teams. They're going to play this week, and then guess what? Whenever they meet, whenever they meet in the playoffs, they're going to play each other again. The winner's going to win a state championship. It's just Charlotte has too many good teams going on. You got Providence that came out of nowhere that's dominating. You got uh, Myers Park that's dominating. You still got Butler that's roaring that only has one loss. I mean, there's too many good teams in Charlotte. It's not even close. And, and before you answer, Grice, um, let me just say that if this was one of those game shows on TV, I would be hitting the ding, ding, ding button while you're saying that, giving you extra points, Sam, because I think you're 100% correct. Grice, uh, your take. I mean, it's tough because I'm, you know, I, I reside, like I always say, I'm 336 made and 704 paid, but I've got to give love to, I've got to give love up to 336 though. I call it the baby IMEC. I've been calling it for a while. Talk about Glenn. You talk about Davie County that's been putting up numbers, beat West Mech last year in the playoffs. Talk about East Forsyth, two times little 4A state title that's always in there. West Forsyth, their only crime was losing to Vance, who everybody else did the exact same thing. Talk about Reagan that's up and coming that if they were in different conferences and they were in a, if they were in a different area, they would be above 500. That conference is the baby I met for a reason. you got teams that are tops in the four little A, but also big four A. So I, I think that area is playing some great football this year, putting up a lot of points. And, and it, it, see, it seems like that little break, that little hiatus didn't hurt the, those guys up there. Hey, so Chris, Chris, what happened, Grace? What happens when those teams that you just mentioned play in the first round of the playoffs? Who do they typically play? 
And then who they bring it back up down here a lot of times. I mean, I, I think, but I think, I think part the big part of that uh, up there in that area is that those guys again, their only crime is the losing the teams that we're all losing to down here. I agree. <laughs> they go up to they they go oh, to the up, they play play up, up, and they're up for basketball. You yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I think they're playing great football. I think this year it's been elevated, though. I mean, you look at so many teams. You just talked about Glenn. And I mean, you know, you talk about the, the offensive production. You look at our list with the high school highs. We've got a lot of guys that are doing big things from that 336 area. And I think Charlotte's playing good football, but you're starting to see some of those teams that were always up there that are starting to decline. And I think you're really seeing the emergence of some great teams up there. So I think you're playing good ball. Trust me, I got to choose a side. That, that baby I make is still doing work up there. You said it. You said it right, though. Baby, I'm at, not grown men. I'm at. I want to say this too. I'm not. I'm not dogging on the the three three six area. I've lived there. Uh, great football. I would add that. In, in, is this a region? Can we say a road is a region? I want to pick Highway seventy four. That gives me Crest, Scotland, uh, Richmond, Burns, Shelby, all those. I'm Wait, say I'm Crest of Scotland. What are we doing here? Goodness, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a region. That's the state. That's a road. <laughs> All right, oh Coach versus Coach, round number two. Uh, Grice, you get first kick of that. Hopewell, Grice, West Charlotte, Griner, this week. Why is your team winning, Grice? You're up first. Yeah, I'm going to take this a little kind of more of a serious turn. Um, I think, you know, the bigger thing, it, it means more, I guess, if to, to steal the SEC uh, slogan. So, again, this is this is year three for us. Uh, these, these seniors – were sophomores when we came in. They were asked to play varsity while their peers were playing JV, while they were playing, you know, and kind of preparing for varsity ball. We were asking our guys to play against some grown men, to play against some guys we see on TV at Syracuse, at Clemson, at North Carolina. These kids did everything we asked, and they've done and, and continue to get better each, each game, each year. And now they're at a point where they have the opportunity to win to allow Hopewell to finish higher than we ever have before, or at least in the past seven, eight years. You talk about this senior class being the best or most prolific in the last seven, eight years. This is them. I, again, I, I come to this game. It's not about us coach versus coach. It's not about me. I I've told them all week. This is about your legacy. This has nothing to do, you know, all due respect with Coach Griner, has nothing to do with us. I told him, you know, even at, you know, at the 50, I told Griner, we're going we're gonna to dab it up, piece it up, pray, and then go out there and do what we do best. But the, the reason why for us is for our guys, it is their legacy. And if you care about your legacy the way you should, you'll come into that game and do what you have to do. Yeah, 100% agree with you. I mean, looking at film, I think Hopewell is playing the best brand of football they've done in the last 20 years. They're, they're really turning the corner. Coach Bird does a phenomenal job. Um, they definitely got, like they said, three years in it. And I just can't wait till I get to my three years because I feel like you establish your uh, your identity with the team. For sure. but like like Coach says, I don't play in this game. And I want these kids to, to dive in deep to their soul and, and come out with some greatness and just compete. Know that, it, that the fight of competing is just such a great thing. It's so welcoming in football when you're playing and you're just grinding and like it might go back and forth it might go back and forth but you're playing and you're sweating and you ain't tired no more but uh i just that's all i want to see is just domination at the line of scrimmage coming off the ball you know finishing off runs big hits i just want to see it just want to see it and i know these kids have it inside them at the west charlotte and it's just tough the covid's really hurt us really really bad and uh, no excuses i take full responsibility but i mean all that pain and suffering will go away if we win Friday. That's for sure. <laughs> you both deserve it. I hope it's a great game. I look forward to talking about it next week. And final here on uh, round three, coach versus coach. If uh, Langston to put the question up for us. What? He, he said he was oh, pushing us all night. He's been pushing us. And now we're waiting on him. Come on, Langston. <laughs> all right, uh, Grice, you get – or no, Griner, it's back to you. Uh, what is the biggest rule change – you'd like to see come to high school football? Mm, that's pretty good. I don't think we have a targeting. Uh, I don't think we have a targeting call in high school, do we, Grace? Because, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't got it. It would be, be hard to adjudicate. I, it. But here's the thing. Like, I, yeah. honestly, I honestly didn't know, and I, I got to go back and look at the rule books, but, like, like roughing penalties or automatic first down, supposedly, this past Friday, I found out. And I did not know that because – High school has always been 15 yards no matter what, no automatic first down. So if that is true, that's a good thing. No rough, Any roughing penalty is an automatic first down like that. If we have a targeting call, I think that will protect kids. 
a little bit more just targeting off people and, and then maybe coming up with some type of rule where maybe they got to sit out a quarter or sit out a half or whatever the case may be. But that's going to be very hard to monitor without, you know, if, you know, having more officials and things of that nature. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me, and, you know, Grinders kind of touched on it, and, you know, it's been a little relevant for us, is the ability for officials to sideline replay. Um, You know, I think it's a situation a lot of times where officials stand on the calls that they make just for the basis of what they, you know, the call that they've stated or the call that they have. You know, and I think with, especially in CMS and a lot of areas using these Pixelock cameras, NFHS network providing an outlet for games to be televised and to have video, having the officials with the ability to go back and review their calls that they made, especially in some of these key elements, can really, you know, help to turn this around as far as certain situations where a call is controversial, as we, you know, talk about the seven overtime game uh, with Kings Mountain and Catholic, where they talked about that, or the, the phantom pass interference or whatever, what have you, you know, that, that would provide them opportunities to make sure they get these calls right. Because there are too many situations where these kids work so hard and don't have that opportunity because it was taken away by a bad call. Mm -hmm. You popped a comment up there, and I'll let you expand on this because I do agree with you about returning kicks out of the end zone. Yeah, I, especially with kickers, more kickers now having that ability to take your offense away from you by putting the ball into the end zone. Uh, I've never liked the rule, but I would love to see it now more so because so many kickers now put it into that end zone, giving you no opportunity. Uh, at all. Man, I tell you, when Rabbit Waddell was playing for Richmond County, dudes was praying Ooh. for kicker kicking his own. Because if he caught it, <laughs> it was a touchdown. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like Nick Maddox was close in, in A.L. Brown. This dude, I mean, every time, every time yeah. he was returning for a touchdown, I, I covered him eight times like during his last two years in Richmond. And I'm telling you, he had four touchdown returns in two games. Oh, the, difference, yeah. the difference in Rabbit and Nick. Rabbit was a straight line fast. He was yeah. there. Nick would dance around the field a hundred times and make yeah. fifty guys miss. Yeah, Nick run two hundred yards. Nick got a head 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 head. He was in high school's heart. Northeast Gilbert ninety seven state championship. Oh, he was at that ninety eight four A state final. Garner and Richmond. Richmond won thirty six to six, and that was despite Garner never, ever on a kickoff or a punt let that ball get anywhere close to Rabbit Waddell. <laughs> that's, that's smart stuff all right sam we're gonna put you in the one shot we're gonna wrap this thing up just kudos to all the football coaches that have made it through this covid regular season you know last game's coming up friday just i mean it was a lot of hard work it's a lot of like wearing the mask do this do the protocol cleaning uniforms every day after practice things of that nature it's just no one really knows how much work you're putting in i just want to say thank you for being uh, great to your staffs and doing everything you do and uh, look for the good games on Friday and then going into the postseason. Absolutely. All right, I teased some big news. The big news is we're moving talking preps to Tuesday. Starting next week, we're going to be on every Tuesday. So when football season hits in the fall, we don't have to rush to try to get done to get y'all to Monday Night Football. And you won't see Gary like doing this when he's talking. <laughs> when he's watching the cow, you know, Gary talking, watch the cow. But what, 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 so wait, wait, wait a minute. The Cowboys are on Monday Night Football? Sometimes. Uh -oh. so, very, so. very rare. We, we are also going to do a, Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're also going to do a Saturday show. Is that right? After the parents come out, we're going to do a Saturday show. We're going to let, let the guys talk to you about the parents. I Maybe try to get a couple coaches on, have a, have a good time. And, and one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour. <laughs> we won't go past one hour. No, not two. <laughs> All right. You can put coaches yeah. on. It's going to be two hours. You know, we talk. <laughs> One hour, but but thanks everybody for hanging in there with us and watching. I appreciate y'all. Um, go ahead, Gary. That it would be fun if they would let us do the show from uh Chapel Hill and let us watch them pull the names out of the hat. What was that magic Johnson mean? No, that's, <laughs> not, that's not happening. That's, 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 that's some transparency for you. That's some transparency. <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm Langston. That's Chris. That's Sam. That's Grace. That's Alex. That's Miss Kenzie. That's Dale. That's Gary. We are talking preps. We'll catch you next Tuesday at eight o'clock. Tuesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs>